Hi, everybody. My name is Michelle Elbert, and I am on the board of directors of ATX Hackerspace, and I'm here to talk to you about cosplay. I apologize that my slides are actually in PowerPoint, but there's a, there's a slide issue right now, so this will have to do. Uh, so uh, first I would like to tell you a little bit about myself. Who am I? Why am I here? Where are we going? And why are we in this sand basket? Um, I have an undergraduate, my undergraduate degree is in theater with a focus on theatrical makeup and wardrobe. Uh, I work for a small amount of time on independent film and television in wardrobe. Uh, I work for Roger Corman at Concord Studios on a really horrible television show called uh, Black Scorpion, the television series. But the cost, it's, it, if you watch it, watch it with the volume off. It's visually, the costume, the, the wardrobe one was really, really great on that and I was very lucky to, uh, to work with her. Um, but then I realized that uh, it totally sucks to live in, out of your car. So I moved on to more uh, conventional forms of employment. So uh, I just thought that I'd like, I have a number of thoughts about, about how to have a great time and make a great costume and be comfortable doing it. So, oops, hold on. My notes. So uh, first I'd like to talk about cosplay and cosplayers. And uh, if, you, if you want a definition for cosplay and cosplayers, go look it up on Wikipedia, because I'm just going to ramble on about what I think. Um, the, when you dress a certain way, maybe not so much in your everyday life, but when you dress a certain way, you are giving a, uh, you're giving a nonverbal communication of something that you're passionate about, whether that's a character, a television show, uh, or just a, a certain ideal or aesthetic. And... Um, so, a friend of mine lives in the UK, and he cosplays as the fourth Doctor uh, from Doctor Who, and he belongs to a group called uh, the Legion, the Iconic Legion. And these people are cosplayers who uh, band together. They come from all different genres, and they go do um, they go do charity work. They raise money. They visit hospitals in their costumes. And there's a picture of my friend walking down the street, with flanked by stormtroopers, dressed as the fourth Doctor, and. He happened upon this uh, one woman, and uh, and she saw how he was dressed and recognized who he was, and so he linked arms with her and walked her across the street. And there's a picture of this, and he's just you know hanging out, being you know playing the fourth doctor, and there are the stormtroopers walking along in their armor. But the look on this woman's face is absolutely priceless. She is having the time of her life. She is tickled pink that the doctor is arm in arm with her walking across the street. And unfortunately, I don't have a copy of this picture right now, uh, but I remember when I saw it, and I was thinking, anytime somebody asks me, why do you cosplay, I'm going to show them a copy of this picture. Because clearly, all he had to do was get in a coat and a scarf and talk a certain way, put a hat on his head, and he made this woman's day, un apparently unexpectedly. And um, so that's, that's something that's really great about cosplay is that you are expressing your love for something, and then someone either appreciates the work you've put into your costume, or they recognize what it is that you're dressed as, or what you're trying to say with your with your clothes. And you see that recognition, that excitement. You can make some you can make somebody incredibly happy just by being dressed a certain way. And if you can make somebody happy by doing something that you enjoy, then like why not? So uh, another thing I get asked a lot when I uh, when I talk about cosplay is, um, do I need to learn how to sew? And the answer is no. I mean, there have been times when I've worn costumes made entirely out of duct tape or have been hot glued together. Um, I bet that's fun to take it, off. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, when you wear, uh, like, a corset or a bodice, I used to work at the Southern California Renaissance Pleasure Fair. At the end of the day, when we would take off our bodices, we would call that an out-of-bodice experience. Uh, and it's always something. You take off one of those corsets or one of those bodices, and you go like this or you get a significant other, or any, just any willing person, quite frankly, to scratch your back. It's the best feeling, pretty much ever. Um, so no, you don't, have to, you don't have to learn how to sew. And uh, obviously, like as here at this event, at Showdown and Obtainium, there are many fine purveyors of, of articles of clothing. And, uh, and this, what I'm wearing right now, just came straight out of my closet. And I didn't, I'm, I'm kind of new to the steampunk sort of community, and I opened up my closet this morning, and I was like, I've got nothing to wear. Oh, wait a minute, this shirt, this vest, this hat. Why didn't I see that yesterday? Um, so even if you look in your closet and you don't feel like you uh, 
you know what to wear, you know, give yourself some time and take a second look. Because it's not important if if you really love character and you really know this is if the, then you really know that character. And there have been studies that uh, fictional characters to which we are particularly uh, drawn or that we are particularly fond of live in the same part of your brain that uh, deceased relatives and or un loved ones who are not present. Uh, live in that part of your brain. You know, you're at the store and you see your aunt Sally. You see, you don't see your aunt Sally, but you see this ugly ceramic cat. And you say to yourself, "There is nothing Aunt Sally would loves more than an ugly ceramic cat." And if I bought my Aunt Sally this ugly ceramic cat, I, she would know exactly where would to put it, and she would name it something like George. And all these things, you know exactly how Aunt Sally would react to that cat. And you you know the same thing about the the characters that you know and love. And so. If you don't have something that's screen accurate, that's okay because you know that character. You can look at an article of clothing and you would say, "Yeah, Zoe Harriet would totally be wearing that dress." And if like, you have the right haircut and you 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 have you have a, an, a, an outfit that tracks, people will see you wearing that outfit and they'll know who you are. Uh, the people who know that character also, and that's that's pretty great. Um, so no, you don't need to. You don't need to learn how to sew. And as a matter of fact, I've, I've had some of my best costume finds at Target, you know, or Goodwill. So I highly recommend that. Um, now, some of you may remember, uh, no, actually, this is a different part. So a friend of mine wrote an article for a website called Douchey DM, pardon my language, uh, and he was talking about Gen Con, and he was discussing cosplayers and cosplayer abuse. And... Um, some of that was people who weren't actually part of the convention mingling with the cosplayers and treating them poorly. But the other thing that he was saying was that if you're going to be, if you're going to go somewhere and you're going to wear a costume, you have to try. You have to put some amount of effort into it. And I was like, well, Mr. High Horse Poofy Pants, who, who are you to be the arbiter of whether or not somebody's tried? Like, how could you, how can you say that? How do you know everybody has a different uh, level of of uh, funding and ability or, or, you know, knowledge or connections. Like, how can you say that somebody did or did not, uh, how can you say that someone did or did not try? And then I scrolled down and I saw this picture. And I don't know uh, if you can read this, you probably can't, but this guy's wearing a cardboard box and it says Gundam on it. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, Gundam is a giant robot mech thing that you ride around in. So I saw this picture and I was like, okay, you, 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 you've made your point. Yes. Uh, so yeah, uh, although I have to admit, if you look at the, uh, the, the expression on this kid's face, it is the very definition of intensity. He is in, he is in the moment. So, uh, so, uh, oh, hold on. So that's, that leads me to my next point. Some of you uh, will remember that Billy Crystal had a character named Fernando. And Fernando would say things like, it is better to look good than to feel good. And I'm here to tell you that that is completely wrong. Um, while it's entirely possible to feel good and not look good, if you're not comfortable in your, in your uh, costume, if you're not comfortable either physically or emotionally, you're not going to be comfortable uh, you're not going to present the best front, and your costume isn't going to look as good as it, as it can. Uh, I had a friend, her name is Bree, and she wanted to go to a Halloween party, but she, didn't, she wasn't feeling the costume that year. She didn't want to wear a costume. It was her dad's Halloween party. She just wanted to go and, and go to her dad's party. And then she found out that everybody at the party was going to be wearing a costume, and everybody was so excited about wearing a costume, and she didn't want to be that person to show up without a costume. But uh, the problem was that she had a husband who was super into making costumes, but he was super into making costumes for himself. He's not her husband anymore. Uh, and that might give you a clue. So another sl small piece of advice before I go on is that if you're going to be uh, having someone make a costume for you, you should be actively involved in the creation of it. That way you will be, you, will, it, you can also say, I participated in the making of this and it's, it's just what you want, and you understand. If it's not just what you want, you understand why it's not just what you want. Um, so she was uh, unhappy with the last costume her husband made for her, and so she comes to me and she's like, "I just want to buy a costume. Let's go to the store." And there's, I'm here to tell you, 
there's nothing wrong with Sorgak costume. There's a lot of jokes about cosplayers. You know, there's a co I saw a comic strip this past October, and it was trick-or-treating at cosplayers' house, and there's a bunch of kids wearing store-bought costumes and a Batman and a Wonder Woman standing at the door, uh, like, oh, store-bought costumes, go away, you don't get any candy. That's not true. That would never happen. Um, it's, I have seen people wear store-bought costumes to, to conventions, and they're having just as much fun as everybody else. There's nothing wrong with it. If, if I think they're a little pricey, and I don't think that you get your money's worth for what you pay, but... If you're in a time crunch and you find what you like and you like how it looks and you think that it's an affordable costume, go for it. Um, but so she said, I want to just go buy a costume. And I said, that's fine. Let's go. I will, I'll give you whatever opinion you need from me. So we went and we found, she found this cute, so cute pirate costume. And she tried it on and she looked adorable, you guys. She looked amazing in this costume. She recently lost some weight. And so I think, I thought she looked super cute in it. And she came out, and I was like, wow! Oh my god, get to a mirror, you have to see this! And she stood there, and she was just like, hmm. And she was, you know, she just kept turning to the side, and fiddling with the shirt, and fiddling with the pants. And she was like, are you sure? And I'm like, yes! That is the one, that is the costume. If you're gonna buy a costume, that is the costume you should buy. And she was, mm, you know, and she couldn't stand still, she couldn't stop fiddling adjusting the shirt that didn't need adjusting, and she kept asking me, are you sure I look okay? Are you sure I look okay? And I just, she wasn't comfortable. You know, it was it was a little more clingy than the clothes she normally wears, and she wasn't she wasn't comfortable in that in the, in those clothes, physically or emotionally. And I said, okay. And it detracted from how adorable, I'm not lying, she looked adorable. She should have bought that costume. But she, she wasn't feeling it. She didn't think she looked good. So I said, okay, take the costume off, we're going somewhere else. And she pounced on me like, aha, you were lying to me. And I'm like, no, you look great in that costume. What you don't look, it's comfortable, and it detracts. So let's go. And we went to, we went to Target, my old standby. We bought her some exercise clothes. Then we went to a hobby shop. We bought some shiny yarn, and we put the shiny yarn in, in strategic places all over the, the tracksuit, and she was a cyborg for Halloween. We got her some fake glasses, and we took a... A wet erase marker, and we that was green, and we put ones and zeros on the on the on the clear fake glasses. So that was her sort of like digital readout. And she again, she looked super cute. It was a costume. We could take the yarn off, and she could use the uh, the uh, the costume elsewhere. So if nothing, if you take nothing else away from my talk, it's that if you don't feel comfortable physically or emotionally in the costume that you're wearing, forget it because you're not going to have a good time. You're going to spend the whole time thinking, oh, my God, does this bustle make my butt look big? Of course it does. That's its job. But, you know, um, so just, you know, be comfortable. As I said, it's possible to feel good and not look good, but people wearing an ill-fitting costume who are happy are way more interesting and visually pleasing, at least to me, than someone wearing something elaborate that they're uncomfortable and unhappy about because they're worried about whatever. So, you know, if you if you take a friend to a store and you go, how do I look? And they go, you look amazing. Just, you know, they're not lying. So, so you know, keep that in mind. Another thing that I would like to encourage you is to always be ready to be inspired by the littlest thing. Um, so here's an example is... Uh, this young lady that I met uh, last year, uh, well, not actually this year, uh, in February in Los Angeles at the Doctor Who convention, Cal Gallifrey One, she saw these glasses. Um, I think she saw them on Amazon. And she went, hey, those kind of look like the eye plates on K9 from Doctor Who. And so she made this cute little gray dress. I'm, this picture does not do it justice. But she made this cute little gray, gray dress with you know, a little panel on the back that represented the back panel of K9, and she put K9 on the front of the dress. She had a little headband with a little aerial ears, and she wore those glasses, and she looked great. I, everybody was like, oh, my God. And you know what? Again, going back to the sewing thing, all you have to do is get a gray outfit. You don't have to sew yourself a dress. You can go to whatever store you like to go to normally, get some solid gray clothing, and just carefully hot glue or stitch witchery or whatever you need onto it, and, and and you're good to go. So, you know, 
always, always be ready. Anytime you think to yourself, hey, that kind of looks like the coat that so-and-so wears. I'd really like to dress as her. You know, keep, keep, keep your mind open to the possibilities no matter what store you're in or what you're looking at. And, and really wonderful things can happen, like a cheesy pair of hipster sunglasses can turn into the hit of whatever convention you're going to. Everybody wanted their picture of this girl including the dog that was also dressed as canine, so or the owners of the dog. Uh, so another thing that happens, and it happened with this PowerPoint situation, is that you will start to run out of time. And uh, <laughs> so um, I don't really have any, I don't really have any advice for this, uh, other than everybody goes through it, and it's okay. And there will be times, it will be 5 o'clock in the morning, and you're crying because you just can't get the sleeves to fit. Don't laugh. <laughs> <coughs> But, um, so it's, you know, it's okay. So the rest of my presentation will not have slides, unless you're watching this on video, in which case I might add some slides later. Uh, let's see. Uh, so I'm going to give you some, uh, actually, I'm going to show you my notes. Please tell me they're there. Oh, here we go. So um, I'm going to give you some rules, but they're really more like guidelines. Uh, for cosplay, and these are just rules of thumb to keep in mind. One that's not up here, uh, if you're going to be at an outdoor event, I can't stress strongly enough natural fibers or natural or, or blends with natural fibers in them. Uh, they breathe better. Uh, you, will, you, you will still be hot. I'm still sweltering, but if, I was, if this was polyester, I wouldn't be here right now. I'd be on the floor of our tent somewhere. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, another important thing to remember is comfortable shoes. Um, when I used to work at the Renaissance Fair uh, in, in California, I, had, I found this adorable pair of shoes that worked perfectly with my garb, but I could not walk in them. However, my job involved sitting on a porch making fun of people. So when I was on the porch sitting down, I wore those shoes. It still hurt, but when it was time to get up and go on parade or, or go somewhere, I would change out my shoes to something that was still appropriate and still looked good with the outfit but was more, um, was more comfortable. So especially at conventions, at, at places like these, if you're going to an outdoor uh, venue and you want to wear heels, that's great. Clunky heels, ladies. Do not sink into the ground like it's Disneyland on opening day. It's ridiculous. Uh, another thing that's important is the ability to sit. Never think, oh, you can even, there are ways to sit wearing hoop skirts or whatever, but if you have to, if you don't have a handler, or by handler I mean a significant other who puts up with your ridiculousness, uh, who can help you take off whatever part of the costume you have to take off uh, before you can sit down, just don't do that. Uh, you have to be able to sit, because if you can't sit, you can't go to the bathroom, and nobody wants, we're not going to talk about urinary tract infections, people, okay? That's not what we're here for, but. We're not. It, <laughs> sorry. Maybe later. You know what? See me after the talk. We'll discuss brands of cranberry juice, it'll be fine. So, uh... You get a lot of those, Phineas? Hmm? Huh? Phineas get a lot of those? <laughs> I don't know. I've never met Phineas before, and, and now that I know that he's really interested in urinary tract infections, I don't think I'm <laughs> This is Tesla's assistant, Phineas. And well, Mr. So Edison... You... you where, well, where's your assistant, Mr. Tesla, uh, Mr. Edison? Um... I don't, have one. I don't have a handler. <laughs> I, I, don't, it's a I don't know, Miss. I don't know, Mr. Ederson. Uh, when I said that, I, I, the the lady to to your left uh, gave you a certain look. So maybe. Uh, the handler look. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, but. Uh, uh, cranberry juice. There's the answer. <laughs> so um, the other thing that uh, that is important, and uh, especially uh, in steampunk, because you've got all these fabulous pocket watches, is pockets. Pockets are important. You have to be able to put your badge somewhere so that you're ready for uh, photo ops without your badge getting in the way. Uh, you have to have your ID money, again, if you don't have a handler. And even if you do, you might get separated from your handler. So you need a place to put, a little discreet place to put your cell phone. Uh, and uh, props, which is the last, the last point. Um, anything, any prop that you have uh, needs to have somewhere to go so that you can have your hands free. If it's a very small prop, it's not too bad. But you, you never want to really set a prop down unless there, it does something, you know. Uh, so if you're like, I'm paying for something and you set your prop down, you're just asking for it to be lost. Um, either you'll forget it or someone will pick it up. Or it, so it's better to have a pocket, a bag, a handler, uh, or a wrist or shoulder strap, especially if you have weapons or a holster. 
Um, it's just, it just makes your life easier. Um, another point is large, very large costumes. When I was at Dragon Con this year, I saw a guy dressed as a ski instructor from that episode of South Park, and he had a sign. And so when he held out his, uh, the sign was this wide. And it said, if your costume is wider than you are tall, you are going to have a bad time. Uh, so just keep, keep that in mind. Keep, keep, uh, size matters and not in the way that you're thinking. Um, let's see. So what does this have to do to steam, with steampunk? Because I'm talking about cosplay. Cosplay is all about being a character from a show or a book or a movie, right? No. Cosplay, which goes back to my point about Wikipedia earlier, I am actually going to talk about it, is short for costume play. Anytime you are in a costume, you're, you're cosplaying. I used to say to myself, now I'm not a cosplayer. It's, it's, that is ridiculous. I have been a cosplayer for a really long time, and I've only recently given in to calling myself that. When Men in Black came out, my friends and I dressed as Men in Black, and we went down to Universal City Walk and spent the entire day, like four or five hours, up to the point where we're going to actually see the movie, walking around in formation, dressed as Men in Black, and the reactions we got were great. It's the reason that you do cosplay, is to see people... Uh, react to what you're wearing or come up and talk to you. So um, so this applies to steampunk because steampunk is also all about non-verbally communicating something about yourself. Um, and um, I had some thoughts on steampunk in general, which you know I think are probably handled better in other, other places by people more qualified than me. But the thing about steampunk is it's not just a genre of uh, fiction, it's not just an aesthetic look, it is a community, a people, and a mindset. The first time I heard about steampunk was a, um, an article on boingboing.net, and it was about a woman who had a steampunk wedding, and the person said, I'd always heard about steampunk as, as fiction, or as an aesthetic, but I never, I never thought about it, that it could be a lifestyle. And the pictures of this woman's wedding were absolutely great. So the, the, somebody's really upset about that. Uh, so, the way this relates to steampunk is that whether you're pretending to be a character that everybody knows or you're dressing up in steampunk, you're still pre presenting a character, whether you're Thomas Edison, Calamity Jane, or, you know, just some bloke. Uh, so you're thinking to yourself, I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm Westinghouse when she said that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Westinghouse. Uh, maybe if you had a handler or an assistant. I, but, um, so... I want to talk to you about creating a character, and the important part about creating a character non-verbally, communicating that is to accessorize. So I have my friend Matt here with me. Yeah, Matt. So I made Matt's uh, lab coat, um, and there are things about it that I'm unhappy with, but Matt seems reasonably happy with it, and I'm going to make some changes to it later. What's the great thing about Matt's costume, or clothing, and it's important that you think of your clothing as clothing and not a costume. Uh, do chores in it, vacuum in it, because not only do you get used to moving in the outfit, especially if you have like hoop skirts or, or you're wearing a sword or whatever, um, it just makes you more comfortable, more natural in uh, in your costume. Uh, when I was working for the Renaissance Fair, I'm sorry, it keeps coming back to this, uh, we were hired by, uh, to be extras on an episode of House with that took place at a Renaissance Fair. And um, and the, the crew were just amazed by us. They said, uh, we just want you to do whatever it is you normally do at fair. And we were like, all right, fine. So we went about our normal day. And they, they were shocked when somebody said, the king approaches, and we all stopped and turned and reverenced the king. And people were like, did somebody tell them to do that? <laughs> what are they doing? And then, of course, the guy playing the king didn't know he had to, like, make a motion or tell us to recover. So we ended up the whole scene like, oh, God. He's not going to tell us to recover, and it's gone on too long, so if we get up now, it'll look weird. Uh, um, you know, uh, during break, we were taking naps, and one guy walked by and snapped a picture, and he's like, they look great just laying around. I don't understand. That's because these are our clothes. We live in them for eight hours, two days a week, three months of the year. So get comfortable in your clothes, and no matter whether you're trying to not look good or you, you might be having an off day, it doesn't matter. If you're comfortable in your clothes, if it's natural, you're going to look great. So back to accessorizing. The best thing about Matt's costume is that he is presenting a character, and this is pretty much all him. I helped him pick out some tools, but I knew he wanted to use this belt. This also goes back to being actively involved in the creation of your costume. I knew he wanted a lab coat, and I knew he wanted to wear this belt. And I was going to make him a Dr. Horrible, 
lab coat. But then I went, no, because he's going to wear the belt. A straight line is not going to look good. So we got the Civil War, a McCall Civil War officer's coat. And that's a frock coat. So it'll look better with a belt. And he, he got the hat. I painted the goggles for him. And he created, he, you look at him and you go, he's some kind of airship engineer or something. The other thing I also really like is that he's used this, the hand crank right about where you normally, uh, you normally put a sword if you're an officer. And he does the same thing. But any time you put a sword on, a, on any person, they'll be like, they'll cock a hip and they'll rest the hand or, or drink on that. And it's, so it's just, it's a really nice touch. I don't know if you did it on purpose, but it's freaking brilliant. So it's important when you accessorize. You take away these accessories, you give him other accessories, he's a completely different person. That if I took off the star and I put a tape measure around my neck, suddenly I'm a, I'm a tailor. If I take off the tape measure and, you know, I change the style of my goggles and, you know, a big white scarf, suddenly I'm a pilot. So, you know, really keep that in mind. And that's the difference. And there's nothing wrong with someone who has an outfit. You can sit down. Thank you. There's nothing wrong with a, the pan for my friend Matt there. Uh, so, um, there's nothing wrong with having a great outfit and slapping some gears on it, but that's the difference. You want, you want to create a character, you want to express something about, about that. So, you think to yourself, you know, Mr. Edison, you walk around and you've got your, your famous inventions with you. Oh, we're good, sir. <laughs> and so people may or may not recognize you as Mr. Edison, although how could they not? You're so famous. Um, <laughs> but they definitely know you're some kind of inventor or, or hey, businessman who works with technology. I mean, it's clear just by looking at you. Modifier with me. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So, um, so when you think about when you think about your care, you know, when you're gathering together your costume pieces, think about what kind of person am I? Am I high class? Am I low class? Am I rich? Am I poor? Am I a simplistic person, or do I do I like elegance and 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 extravagance. Um, what do you do for a living? Um, what kinds of things would that kind of, the kind of person you want to portray have on them? Um, and and when, you, when you do that, you go from somebody who being, I just threw this together from my closet this morning to someone with an actual character. So uh, I hope, you, I hope uh, that was very helpful. So just one last thing I wanted to talk about steampunk and fashion. And that is that the first time I saw women in the steampunk movement, and they were wearing their corsets on the outside, oh, and I was I was shocked, and I was kind of like, oh, I don't I don't know how that looks. That's an undergarment. It's it's support. It's you know, I I, I couldn't quite get it. But then you know, it kind of dawned on me. Um, I was listening to a an interview with a gentleman from a, a web series called The League of Steam, and uh, one of the things that one of them said is that steampunk is uh, you know, all of the gentility and elegance of a bygone era and all of the benefits that we have living in today's social mores. You know, women are not marginalized. You know, minorities are not marginalized. And that's what wearing a corset, I know that's probably not, it's like, hey, I want to be sexy. Corsets are sexy. Let's, let's flaunt it. And then, but that's what's so great is you can think that way and it doesn't, it, it, you don't think it doesn't mean anything, but it means a lot. I'm going to cry. I'm sorry. Um, you know, there is not only a movement in steampunk of, of being feminine while still, you know, being a, an adventurer or, or a steampunk, you know, uh, ship pilot or whatever, but it's also flaunting that you're a woman. And, uh, you know, there are lots of different movements in uh, uh, cosplay where men dress as female characters, but they're still men, or women dress as male characters, but they're still women. Um, I, I was at a Doctor Who convention, and I saw a female seventh doctor and a male ace, and they were adorable. They're clearly dating. And, um, and that's really great, because it's breaking down, like, I love this character, but I am a woman or a man, and that's okay. Uh, I, I read an interview with uh, Courtney Love during that very brief time, which wasn't crazy, and she, uh, she was, she, there was this point where she was going around, and she was wearing, like, high fashion, like really nicely tailored outfits, and she was getting more involved in the business end of her music career, and people were deriding her for, for dressing so nicely, and she said in an interview, she's like, why is there no place in rock and roll for fashion? Is it because there's no place in rock and roll for women? And I don't think it's, I don't think there's this evil like, we'll keep the women out, but, you know, 
Sisters are doing it for themselves, people. And uh, and so 